Hello folks, Dick Fairburn here. For the past several weeks I've been discussing handgun self-defense cartridges. From the 22 long rifle all the way up to the 10 millimeter and beyond. I've discussed the merits of these cartridges as well as the kind of demerits that some of them have. Been a popular series and I appreciate all the viewers that have, that have looked at those videos and uh, the subscribers that have signed up. Let's take another step and talk about some other cartridges. Fighting rifle cartridges. This is the most common one in the United States today. Where did it come from? How good is it really? Let's begin this discussion. Let's talk about fighting rifle calibers. Stick around. Handguns make up the primary self-defense weapons used by Americans on their persons and concealed carry in their homes, in their vehicles. But another category of weapons very important to our self-defense is for rifles. And these come from little to big. That's a pretty little one, but it's the most common one used in the United States today. Rifles traditionally are more of a hunting weapon for most citizens than a fighting weapon. Those who fight with the rifles are the military and, and you know, thanks to some of us uh, 30 or 40 years ago who started promoting patrol rifles, we see rifles in the hands of uh, law enforcement officers now very regularly. But they can also be the most powerful thing available to you for self-defense in your home in your vehicle, possibly as a truck gun, or even on a larger scale. Uh, the Second Amendment really was not all about self-defense. It's also about resisting tyranny, and um, some of us think we're getting close to tyranny in this country. Some have promoted a Minuteman concept. If this country really goes down the tubes, will we be forced to fight our way back to freedom? That's some pretty heavy stuff to think about. If we do, we are going to have need for fighting rifles. So a little history. Let's look back. 1866, the United States military adopted their first rifle cartridge, center fire rifle cartridge. They had toyed around with some rim fires in uh, the Civil War. But the 5070 cartridge was the first center fire cartridge used by the, the U.S. military. They only used it for a few years. It very quickly was changed to the 4570, which is still a very, very popular cartridge today. And the, the uh, 4570 came out, and of course, in the 1873 Trapdoor Springfield. Since then, from the 5070 to the 4570, we evolved to the 3040 Crag used in the 98 Crag bolt action rifle. About the primary service that it saw was uh, the Spanish-American War. From there we decided we needed a cartridge of our own, a rifle of our own. We developed the 1903 Springfield that was so closely copied off of the Mauser 98 design that we eventually had to pay them a royalty for it. And the first cartridge was the 30 aught 3 long 220 grain round nose bullet not taking advantage of the latest technology because when we fought the Spanish-American War they were using the 7 by 57 Mauser rifles with lighter sharp pointed Spitzer bullets we should have learned from that 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 was the technology of the future so the 30-03 only lasted a couple of years itself and was replaced by the 30-06 which changed to a 150 grain sharp pointed bullet at a considerably higher muzzle velocity and that cartridge was in use by our military up until, in some respects, the 70s, uh, at least with the National Guard. And uh, those rifles are still very popular. 
and rifles chambered for the 30 out 6 can still be had by the civilian marksmanship program, uh, the M1 Garands. From there, we decided to modernize again. We decided we could shorten the case length with more modern powders, get the same performance from a shorter cartridge that would use less brass, be a smaller action design. That shortened cartridge became the 762 by 51 millimeter, also called the 308 Winchester in a commercial version, which I believe actually was standardized and hit the market a couple years before the M14's cartridge. And that was ultimately to become the first NATO standardized cartridge for all of the Northern Atlantic Treaty Organization warring groups. Now that cartridge is still in use today in machine guns. And in fact, some of those M14s in the last 10 or 15 years have been pulled out of mothballs upgraded with optics and fielded as designated marksman rifles. So that cartridge and the M14 are still seeing a little bit of use there in the military. But as a battle rifle, the M14 didn't last that long either. Uh, we started into Vietnam with it, but very quickly we saw a very small cartridge in a very radically designed rifle come on the market. That was in 1957 when we first started looking at a small caliber, high velocity rifle. There were several variations of a 222 Remington cartridge, which was designed as a varmint round. They lengthened it slightly, and uh, those variations eventually standardized in what civilian nomenclature is the 223 Remington, and as the 5.56 by 45, also now a NATO standard cartridge. Both Winchester and a company called Fairchild Armalite developed test rifles for this little cartridge. And the Armalite was very radical. Uh, aluminum, primarily made of aluminum, plastic furniture, an upper and lower receiver that, that, that would pop apart, and a gas system that did not drive a piston to operate the action but actually directly impinged on the bolt itself. The bolt became the piston to operate that rifle. Pretty radical stuff, but very interesting too. The story goes that uh, Air Force General Curtis LeMay was at a, a military 4th of July picnic in the, in the early time frame of the, around 1960 or so. And someone had there an AR-15 at the picnic. He shot it and he thought it was pretty cool. So he ordered that this rifle and this cartridge be tested by the Air Force as a, as a potential replacement for the M14. And during that testing, the Air Force showed that 43% of the shooters qualified expert with an M16, while only 22% of the shooters qualified expert with an M14. And based on that, Curtis LeMay ordered 80,000 rifles. And the Armalite AR-15 was on its way. In 1963, it was standardized by the U.S. military as the M16. It launched that 55-grain full metal jacket at about 3,250 feet per second from a 20-inch barrel of the original M16. Now, when the M16 went into Vietnam with the Army, a number of problems almost immediately started to occur. First of all, somewhere along the line, the soldiers have been told that these rifles were self-cleaning, so they didn't really need to clean or lubricate them, which was wrong. That caused problems. The, the, the humidity and, and the torrential downpour of rain during the monsoon season in Vietnam caused a lot of problems as well. Another problem was that originally this had been designed for a stick powder loaded by IMR, to get the per kind of production they wanted and get, and get the kind of velocities they wanted, they found that a ball powder produced by Winchester Olin did a better job. When ball powders are manufactured, at one stage in their, in their creation, they become pretty acidic. And Olin neutralized that by adding calcium carbonate. And uh, I, I don't recall the numbers from the original article I read, but it was somewhere around 3% calcium carbonate neutralized the acid. Well, under those humid conditions, that calcium carbonate would kind of crystallize in the gas tube of the M16. And so it started to clog down that gas tube and fill it full of lime, essentially. 
So Olin did a lot of research and they eventually brought that percentage, 3% calcium carbonate. They found they could get down below one half of 1% and still effectively neutralize the acidity. So that allowed them to eliminate that liming or calcium carbonate problem from the rifles as well. So the M16 had early problems and had a bad reputation. The first upgrade of the M16 was known as the M16A1. So several changes were made to the M16A1. First of all, it had a chrome lined bore. They plated the chamber and the uh, internal bore with chrome. That prevented the corrosion from the high humidity. They added a bolt forward assist mechanism to the right side of the rifle that allowed you to, to bump that action and positively seat a cartridge if, if the uh, spring action alone didn't drive it into the chamber, if it was dirty or contaminated with some crud from the field. Another change they made to the M16A1 was to change the twist rate in the barrel. The original M16 or AR-15 had used a, a twist rate of one turn for every 14 inches of bullet travel. And it's my understanding that's where they started with the 222 that was lengthened into the 223, so they just stuck with that 1 and 14 twist. But it was designed around rather lightweight varmint kind of bullets. What they found with the M16 was, especially the uh, M, I believe it was an M196 tracer bullet, and tracers are longer because part of their core is not lead, but it's a burning compound. And, and twist rate is driven not so much by the weight of the bullet, but by the length of the bullet. How, how long it is, how fast it has to turn to keep from inverting in flight. And they found that those longer tracer bullets, especially under Arctic conditions in Alaska, they were going unstable. So they tightened up that twist a little bit from 1 in 14 to 1 in 12. Now one positive thing about the original M16 is it had a, a reputation as a vicious wounder when they were shooting people with it in Vietnam. And that's because the bullet was just barely stabilized. Uh, and, and no matter how fast you spin a bullet to stabilize it in air, you, there is no amount of twist that will stabilize it in a denser medium like tissue. So at some point in the process, that bullet will, the center of gravity will become forward. It, it will invert and the center of gravity will go to the forefront of its penetration. When this little 55 grain bullet does that, when it flips over and is passing sideways through the medium like tissue, it's rather fragile. It has a crimp groove in there called a cantilever. It generally will break at that point. The front half will continue on to penetrate 12, 14 inches or sometimes more. But that back half blows into fragments. And so when it does that, it behaves like a varmint bullet from the original 222. So it was creating some very devastating wounds. But the M16A1, with that slightly more stable barrel, didn't create those kind of wounds. It still does. The M193 bullet will still go sideways at some point in its passage. It will break into fragments and it makes a devastating wound. It's a little erratic, so you can't predict exactly where it's going to happen. And you probably need about three or four inches of, of solid torso to where it reaches that point of, of trying to invert. Uh, the green tip that we'll talk about later, the 62 green bullet, it will do that as well, but it does it even deeper, and it is even more erratic. So that was the change to the M16A1. And, and you know, it, why am I talking rifles when I'm here to talk about rifle cartridges? I think we have to talk about the evolution of the M16 to illustrate where we are now with the state of the 5.56 or 223 round. In 1980, the 5.56 was standardized by NATO, but they did not like the 55 grain bullet. The Belgians had designed a 62 grain bullet called an SS109, and it has a small steel insert in the tip to give it a little bit of added penetration. That steel being lighter than lead, and it's a 62, not a 55, that made for a longer bearing surface, so that longer bullet needs to be spun faster. And so in our M16A2, the twist rate was changed to one turn in every seven inches, twice as fast as the original one in 14. So that's quite a change for a cartridge to go through during its evolution. Bullet that 62 grain load in the United States was known as the M855. It has a green tip on it because it 
Externally, it looks just like the 55, but the green tip shows you that that is the, uh, the heavier bullet. It is intended for the M16A2s, and now the M4s, and other variations of the, the M16. Uh, there is a newer version of the M855 that improves on it. It's called the M855A1. It is, it is becoming widespread in the military. It's pretty hard to find on the civilian market. And um, I don't think it's really a player in what we're going to be talking about here today at this point. I said the 5.56 is also known as the 223. They actually differ slightly in the way their chambers are cut. The lead, where the, where the mouth of the chamber funnels into the rifling, the lead dimensions are somewhat different between the 223 and the 5.56. Also, the 5.56 pressure, upper pressure limits are higher than a 223. So it has always been safe to fire 223 ammo in a 556 chamber. Generally, it's not recommended that you fire 556 in a 223 commercial chamber. Now I have done that before I knew the difference about leads and things like that. I have a, a really nice little Kimber model 82 bolt action. That's the old Kimber of Oregon, not the current Kimber company from New York. And, and I fired some, you know, M193 55 grain ball in there, not knowing any better. It didn't blow anything up. It didn't really even stress it much that I could tell, but it's not a great idea. Some manufacturers have what they call a wild chamber. That's W-Y-L-D-E, named after the guy who created the dimensions. And it's safe with either type of ammo. Some people claim the wild chamber will give better accuracy than a 5.56 chamber, but I have owned and fired 5.56 five, chambered ARs that would shoot sub-minute, half-minute groups. So there is nothing wrong with the accuracy potential of the 5.56 five, and the 5.56 five, chamber. Now I've been talking about the M16. Obviously this cartridge is, is, uh, has been found over the years in other military-style semi-auto rifles. Balment, the Israeli Galil Steyr Aug uses this cartridge. Ruger Mini 14s, if you want to call those a military rifle. They are used by some law enforcement agency. And some variations of the AK design can be had in, in 5.56 as well. But the AR platform is by far the most commonly encountered rifle that fires this cartridge in the United States. Now, the, the 5.56 was not popular with a lot of soldiers, Army, Marines. They thought uh, war fighters needed a battle rifle. They needed a 30 out 6 or a 7.62 to get the reach, to hit harder at those longer distances and to better penetrate light cover. And maybe they're right. I mean, the, uh, the M16 and, and its cartridge were never intended to be a battle rifle. But it is the longest serving rifle in U.S. military history. And in my opinion, it's uh, almost ideal for most soldiers probably not all. Now just recently we saw the Army adopt a new rifle and a new cartridge. To my knowledge it is not being issued out generally yet and that is the 6.8 by 51 developed by SIG and the civilian name for that is the 277 Fury. It's a, a very impressive cartridge. It uses very high working pressures of around 80,000 PSI. It does that by using a two-piece cartridge case with a stainless steel head, some kind of an aluminum washer that wedges together with a brass forward part of the case, and that's how they're able to handle those pressures. I'm not sure it's the brightest idea I've ever heard of. I think that's going to complicate manufacture, and time will tell if that is really a good addition. At any rate, I don't think the Army intends it for all of their soldiers. Probably the bulk of people will still be carrying something like an M4 using the 5.56. But infantry, the, you know, the frontline troops, perhaps special operators, will uh, have that larger caliber available. And it's also supposed to be included in a machine gun to replace the 7.62 machine guns. As I said, time will tell. But the evolution of this cartridge, the 5.56 or the 223, uh, has had a couple of interesting turns in the last 20 or 30 years. My friend Jeff Hoffman is the CEO of Black Hills Ammunition, and if it sounds like a commercial for him, it's not, and he does not sponsor me in any way. Uh, he has provided me ammunition over the years, and I, and I greatly appreciate that. But 
what he does at Black Hills Ammunition is produce ammo unlike really any other company. In 1999, the, uh, the Navy, mostly the SEALs, requested Black Hills Ammunition to help them develop a load for a Mark 12 special purpose rifle. That's kind of a, for, light, for a simplified term, it's kind of a light sniper rifle used by the SEALs and some other special operators. And Black Hills had been producing heavy bullet match ammunition in 5.56 for the U.S. Army Marksmanship Unit. And so they had really perfected a way to come up with some very accurate stuff. And that's why they were asked to help develop the load for the, for the Mark 12. What they came up with was a, a load using a 77 grain Sierra open tip match. 77 grain open tip match. It's a Sierra bullet. It looks a lot like the 193. Uh, the, the profile of the bullet is not that much different. It is an open tip uh, because that's how Sierra match bullets are, are made. It is not necessarily intended to cause expansion, but they do fragment when they hit a, a human target. And that 77 grain bullet in, in the load that they developed has become really the standard of the world for 5.56 kind of ammunition. And one thing that, that Jeff Hoffman did, uh, the, the load was eventually called a Mark 262. Then they fiddled with some powders along the way, and uh, Jeff had always told them that they needed a, a crimping cantaloupe on the bullet and to actually crimp the case in, which match bullets never have cantaloupes. And every so-called expert said, if you put a cantaloupe in there and you crimp the case, you're going to destroy the accuracy. But in his research, Jeff Hoffman was convinced that it improves accuracy. So eventually they, they settled on a powder and they rolled cantaloupes into these Sierra bullets and crimped them in place. And it's now the Mark 262 Mod 1. It has the most stringent accuracy standards of any load the United States military has ever specified. When he loads a given lot of ammunition to meet military standards, they have to fire 10 groups of 10 shots each. So 10 round groups at 300 yards and all of those groups have to stay under two inches center to center at 300 yards. So that's, in other words, it's less than two thirds, 0.64 MOA for 10 shot groups. I don't think there's any other ammunition out there that can meet those kind of standards, but this does. And it is available for civilians to buy. I think you have to buy it in ammo can lots, so you have to buy quite a bit. And I have a little story about it. Uh, when I was running the, uh, the firearms training unit at the Illinois State Police, this was 2002, our special operators by then had already done some time in Afghanistan after the attacks of September 11, 2001. Uh, one of the Delta operators had been wounded. He was convalescing here in the States, and uh, we had a former Delta guy on our staff at the, uh, the Academy Range. And this young man stopped by to see his buddy for a while, and he told me a story about this Mark 262 ammo. He said they were in Afghanistan. The uh, Delta operators were, were firing this load, and uh, they said they were hitting bad guys way out there, and when they hit them, it really thumped them down. A company of 75th Rangers was posted nearby, and they were using very short barrel M4s and using the traditional green tip M855 ammo, and they said their problem was when they'd hit somebody out past 75 or 100 yards, it didn't knock the bad guys down. They said they knew they were hitting them. They'd see dust fly off their clothes, but it just kind of drilled a 22 caliber hole and didn't have a lot of good terminal effect. And so the Delta guy said it got so bad at one point that they actually had to post guards at night because the Rangers were trying to sneak in at night and steal the good Mark 262 ammo that was putting the bad guys down so effectively. So I passed that along to Jeff Hoffman, and he just chuckled on the other end of the phone. He goes, my stuff's so good, they're stealing it. I love it. Another attempt to up upgrade and improve on that M855 round was developed by the Marine Corps, and it is called the Mark 318 load. It originally used a 62 grain open tip bullet that had a copper base and jacket with a kind of a forward lead core in it. It improved accuracy, it improved penetration and light cover over the M855. They had some growth issues with it. The current version is called the Mark 318 Mod 1. 
it now is all copper. It's a copper base, copper jacket, and a, and a copper core. And they also nickel plate the projectiles, so they're silver colored, and that makes sure that they're not being confused with the uh, Mark 262 load. So it's my understanding the Marines are uh, using that Mark 318 and having good luck with it. That is not commonly available to civilians in the United States that I'm aware of, but there are two pretty high-end loads. So for you as a civilian, if you're going to use a, an AR-15 or, or some other type of uh, 5.56 caliber rifle for self-defense, home defense, if you live in a rural community, if you want to carry one in your truck for whatever reason you might need, there are more civilian loads in the 5.56, 223 world than we could ever list for you. I think by the time we got an attempt to put them all on paper, there would have been more developed in the, in the interim. They range from 40 grains to 80 grains. There are jacketed hollow points. There are jacketed soft points. There are bonded bullets. Some of them are really varmint type bullets, lightweight, very fragile, gonna, gonna really go off inside of a, a human or animal target and not penetrate very deeply. Interestingly, those are one of the most common rounds we see in law enforcement carbines on the street simply because they are low bid. Ammo's bought on state bid. The lowest bid you're gonna get is probably a 55 grain jacket at hollow point, jacket at soft point. And even though they have rather shallow penetration, they seem to perform very well on the street for law enforcement officers. They're very easily going to go through heavy clothing. Most shots are going to be frontal shots, so we don't need 12 to 16, 18 inches of penetration. Eight or 10 can still do an awful lot of damage to the you know, a frontal shot on a human being. So a lot of these loads can perform well for you. There is one load also by Black Hills Ammunition. I mean, they have done so much work and development with the 5.56 cartridge. Jeff Hoffman developed a load intended strictly for police patrol rifles. And he it is called the 50 grain optimized TSX. It uses a Barnes X bullet, which is all copper, hollow point. But it is made a great deal tougher than the standard 50 grain TSX you might buy direct from Barnes. That is essentially a varmint bullet. This 50 is a proprietary model made just for Black Hills ammo. It is made especially tough. It works very well through the FBI's eight-part ammunition testing protocol, which has a number of intervening barriers that they shoot through, which includes auto glass, auto metal, sheetrock, plywood, things of that sort. It is almost barrier blind, which means it will go through those barriers and then still give excellent terminal performance when it hits tissue. The 50 grain load fits in with the twist rates, and I'll explain that in a minute. So this carbine load that he has developed was intended for police patrol rifles. It'll go through barriers well. It gives devastating terminal performance when that bullet expands, and it will do that from even the shortest barrels. So really, even from short-barreled rifles or AR pistols, this 50 grain optimized will work very well. Because it's a tougher bullet, it has a velocity threshold, and when you get past about 200 yards, the velocity has dropped off to where it will not expand the way you would like it to. So it's intended as kind of a zero to perhaps 200 yard devastating round. Now, all of these rounds, the Mark 262, the, uh, the 50 optimized, all of these rounds are expensive. And... You know, I don't think you're going to stockpile a thousand rounds of these <laughs> unless you have a lot more free cash than, uh, than I have available myself. So if you're going to stockpile ammo, what I would suggest to you is that you have two or three 30 round magazines loaded with your premium load. If it's marked, if you're going to be working at distances, Mark 262 is probably the best load to get. If you're working up close, which is 99% of what most of us are going to do, that 50 optimized it is a great load. And then you pair that with a full metal jacket load that is much less expensive and really much more readily available. 
the 50 pairs almost a perfect trajectory match with the original M193 bullet. And this is a really good round to have in bulk because it actually performs pretty well in terminal ballistics as, as well. Now I said I'd get to twist rate. We've seen the twist rate of the M16 go from 1 in 14 in the original, 1 in 12 with the advent of the uh, M16A2, which evolved into the M4, it's a 1 in 7 twist. There's a lot of confusion out there about what bullet weight you should match with what twist. The original twist of 1 in 12 will stabilize bullets up to about 60 grains. If you get beyond 60 grains, especially longer designs like the M855, which has some steel in it, so it's even longer than, than a pure lead core would be, I have seen those M855 bullets print on a target perfectly sideways at 25 yards when they're fired from a 1 and 12 inch twist. They will not stabilize in a 1 and 12 inch twist. So the light bullets originally fit with the fast with the, the 1 and 12 inch twist barrels. So we're going to pair that over there with the 50. The heavier bullets like the Mark 262 77 grain bullet or the green tip M855, they need a faster twist rate. 1 in 7 is probably faster than they really need to be stabilized. A 1 in 9 will generally do it. But what we have learned is that you basically can't overstabilize a rifle bullet. If you twist it faster than it needs to be stable, it doesn't hurt anything. It still stays stable. So, heavy bullets, 77 grain, 62 grain, they need a fast twist barrel. Lighter bullets, 50, 55, they'll fire from anything. Black Hills has a 52 grain match load that Jeff gave me some of years ago. I've used them for coyote hunting and prairie dog hunting and they are devastating varmint loads. They're very shallow penetrators and they're not a good pick for shooting people with or even anything much bigger than a coyote. But they are the most superbly accurate load I've ever found in a 223 or 556. Every So I use them as, a, as an accuracy test for any new rifle I look at. And they will always give me the best group I will ever get out of that rifle. That's a 52. That includes one in seven twist barrels. They will they will typically put print that load. You can put three rounds under a dime, at the very least under a nickel at 100 yards. So don't believe the idea that, that light bullets will not be accurate in a fast twist barrel. They will be just fine. It's the heavy bullets that are restricted, and they need one in nine up to a one and seven inch twist. Okay, so I've geeked out on twist rates and all the kind of stuff that a lot of you probably aren't that interested in. Let's get to the point I took when I looked at the pistol cartridges and I gave them a one word descriptor. I said the 380 was marginal and the nine millimeter was adequate. The larger calibers like 45s, 10s, 357 Magnums, I said were reliable. So how does the 556 or the 223 stack up in terms of man stopping ability? Well, it depends on which ammo you pick, it, the distance is fired, uh, even to some degree the rifle that you fire it from. In my experience, this is an ass kicking little round. Now I've never shot any people with it. I've been a pound of trigger pull a couple of times looking over the sights of an AR-15, but in both of those cases, I gave someone a command to drop a gun, and they did. This does not hit a heavy blow like a 308 or 762, or like the new 6.8 by 51 is going to strike. For that, you need a larger round and a larger, heavier weapon. But when these rounds are used against animals up to the weight of a couple of hundred pounds, which includes two-legged animals up to a couple hundred pounds or more, they are devastatingly effective in my opinion. Now in my experience I have shot a number of animals in Wyoming with a Colt AR-15 SP-1, that's the original 20 inch 1 in 12 barrel. The load we carried most of the time was Federal White Box M193, 55 grain full metal jacket ammunition. At the time, there were no high-tech loads. There were either varmint hollow points and soft points or the 55 full metal jacket in those days. Now, I have hit dogs from 40 pounds on up. I have hit sheep, antelope, deer, 
animals normally hit by cars, or sometimes in one case, a, a sheep rancher had been attacked by probably several coyotes, and he had a number of sheep which were disemboweled and dying. And you know, he said, "Can you put them down for me? Put them out of their misery?" And I did. They were pretty substantial size sheep, and if you put a full metal jacket in their torso, they went down right where they stood. Perhaps one step or two. I've shot two or three violent dogs. One was a Doberman that was charging me. And if you get that into the front end of a dog that size, it's down. It may not be killed outright. Uh, when that one I hit, tried to get back up, so I gave it a second round. But if you get this into the, the main torso of an animal the size of a man or smaller, even that full metal jacket round, it's over. They're not going very far. Now, I said it was out of a 20-inch barrel. The furthest shots of those that I can remember were probably around 200 yards. So they're inside of 200 yards. That was from a 20-inch barrel. Marty Fackler, when he developed the 10% gelatin test, testing the M193 round, and, and he demonstrated how it would, it would invert in the process of passage through the, the tissue. It would break at the cantilever, spray the back end as fragments, and then the front end would continue on to about 12 or 14 inches. He downloaded that to see how far out that effect would take place, and he said it did that reliably down to about 2,500 feet per second. From a 20-inch barrel, that's right at 200 yards. From a 16-inch barrel, it's probably 150 yards. From some of the very, very short variations of the M4, that might be 75 yards when it hits that threshold of 2,500 feet per second and will no longer invert and break. As I said, the M855 green tip will do the same thing. It might need a little bit more velocity, and it's probably going to occur deeper into the animal, so the smaller animals, it may pass through before it ever gets the chance to do that invert and breaking process. But out to 150 yards or so, this is a devastating effective load. Uh, I mentioned on another video that uh, a gun writer I knew had gone to Texas to shoot pigs out of a helicopter, which is a life's ambition for me. The helicopter service provided him with a rifle and M193 full metal jackets. And this gun writer said, well, gee, isn't that terrible? I mean, that's just going to wound those pigs. It, it's not a humane killer, is it? The guy said, you tell me after you've used it. And this gun writer was amazed. He said, he's hitting large hogs up to a couple hundred pounds at a dead run. And he said, if he got a good hit into the front end of that pig, it rolled him. It really put them down. He said very, very rarely did they have to hit them with a second shot to keep them down. So the full metal jacket is a great load. So if you've got two or three magazines of the really expensive premium stuff, backed up by some of these bulk packs of the 193s with the 55 grain full metal jacket, I don't care where this country goes. I think you're prepared to defend your home, your family, your ranch, your neighborhood, whatever it is that you might choose to use that rifle for. So that's my thoughts on the 556 or the 223 Remington. And and 223 Remington in a bolt action can be just as effective on people, more precisely perhaps because you've generally got a scope and, and a really fine trigger pull and all those things that go with it. As fighting rifle cartridges go, I think there's a reason that we've been using this round for 50 years or more. Because it works. It's not a battle rifle cartridge. It's not a good hunting round for animals beyond the size of perhaps a white-tailed deer. But for hunting the ultimate animal, the two-legged animal that will kill you when they want, it's a pretty effective cartridge. And I think it's a good one to start talking about. Fighting rifle cartridges. That's the one I like. I like several. We're going to talk about some bigger stuff. Talk about the 762 by 51 We'll talk about the 300 Blackout, which is probably the number two choice for people shooting with an AR platform weapon. That also has a very interesting history. And we'll, we'll talk about you know the good points and the bad points of the 300. If you've got a rifle cartridge you want to hear about that you think is a, is a valid fighting rifle cartridge, put it in the comments. Uh, I have not finalized the whole list of these. But 
This is the most complicated because it's gone through so many variations of bullet weight, rifling twist rates to get to where it is today. And interestingly, one of the most all-around general purpose rounds we can get for this is the original, the M193. And it's still very effective at short to moderate range on light to medium animals. I hope this has been interesting for you. I appreciate you watching and I ask that you subscribe, ring the little bell. And if you like what's going on here, give me a thumbs up and give me a comment. I love hearing the comments and if you disagree, that's fine too. Next time, we're going to talk about the 300 Black. See you then. Okay, we got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh-huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl. Last one. You ready? You ready? Yeah. That's all there is till next time.